Hi, my name is Dana Arnett, co-host of Wicked Marketing, along with my partner, Carlos Sapene. You can find more information about us and our business on LinkedIn. Or if you have any questions, email us at info at wickedbionic.com. Subscribe to Wicked Marketing on Apple Podcasts and write an awesome review for us. We're also on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Google Play. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Dana. And I'm Carlos. Welcome to our podcast today. Carlos and I have been talking a lot about, we have a lot of newer business owners, and not even just newer, but people that maybe haven't hired a marketing agency. Yeah, there are people that own businesses for a while that are starting their marketing, or that they're taking over their marketing, or that they have a new marketing person. Or they've never had an agency and they're interviewing, right? So people will call us and say, because it's not their business. I have a friend who's an accountant. She has a beautiful, successful accountant business. She Mm -hmm. doesn't know when a marketing agency gives her proposal what it means. So we get a lot of calls and we'll get on with people just to talk friends, you know, people are in colleagues. um, And we'll talk about what questions to ask and what things that might not look right or whatever. So we kind of want to run through some questions when you are hiring your marketing agency and what to look for or not look for or what to pay attention to, um, because we think there's just some general uh, things because people want to get your business, right? So mm-hmm. make promises that might not necessarily... Well, and, the, and another thing I think that another case that also comes to us quite a bit is people that were uh, in marketing or were, uh, or were using marketing before and now coming back into marketing or getting pitched uh, digital marketing as a savior right as the new savior too um and they just don't know what to ask what the differences are um and and whether to believe what they're listening to as well well and because some people and i've seen some of these presentations they're beautiful right and they Mm -hmm. use all the language that we use and it's hard because you're like well what makes you different than them or them different than you but Mm -hmm. there are some definite it's easy to do a nice deck but mm-hmm. when you have conversations with people, I think that's the, the thing to point out. So um, why don't we even talk about just what things look like when promises are made or people are talking about, I can do this for you as far as I can reach all these people and I can bring them. To well, you. and that's the thing, right? There's two types or, or two main, main types of marketing. There is uh, paid marketing and organic marketing. So let's start even there, right? Because when people are getting pitched marketing or they're getting pitched advertising, uh, it, it's one of two types. There's the organic world, which is the, we'll manage your social media channels and we'll get you people through those channels. And then there's the paid where it's like, we'll place your ads on Facebook and other social media channels, right? Like Snapchat and Instagram, and whatever, uh, which is part of what we do. Uh, and they're very different, right? Uh, and, and one should feed the other, uh, but neither one can make uh, perfect guarantees uh, without having a, a good strategy behind it. So one of the main things that people come to us and ask us is, how do I know or what questions should I ask uh, when when someone's pitching me something? And what I always tell them is that the first thing that you have to do is listen to what the pitch is. Because a lot of people get so anxious about new things, right? Mm -hmm. I'm anxious about digital. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's on social media. I know I am on social media. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how it works. I'm anxious about it. I need to be there. I need to be there because I have to be there uh, because that's where everywhere everyone is and I'm anxious about it. So someone's coming and telling me that they can do this and that they're going to get me 10 clients within the first week. (laughs) And am I, am I, I'd like that person. Crazy. I'm going to hire them. That's crazy or like, but they want, you know, $10,000 to do it. And like we get, it's always, it always, those questions always come with a level of anxiety. And the first thing that I say is just take a second, like take a breath and really listen to what the marketer or advertiser is talking to you about, because there's two uh, worlds in it, right? There's the world of, uh, strategy and analysis and really kicking off knowing what you're doing. And then there's the world of let's use your money to discover what you need. Right. And we're from the world of let's strategize and think about it so that we're spending your money smart from the beginning. Right. And but we do tend to see a lot of people that will make you promises. Well, now, here's the thing. 
Carlos, are we right? We see proposals that do not have a strategy. I don't I'm going to manage the social media, but not, not a strategy. Yeah. And they just start with, you're going to give me $5,000 a month and I'm going to uh, run and manage your, your social or your advertising and we'll go from there and I can guarantee you that I'm going to get you people. Listen, if you give me $20,000, I can guarantee you that I'll get you some people, right? Because I can go fishing in the ocean, which is the advertising world, or I can go fishing where I know where the fish are, which is having a strategy. Right. right. And know right. that these are the right fish for you. And I always use this analogy of I rather have a customer that comes in and spends twenty dollars ten times than a customer that comes in and spends forty dollars once. Right. Long term. Yep. Right. Because at the end of the day, I want a customer that comes back because they're not going to spend $20 every time. They're going to come in and spend, it's called the value ladder, right? They come in, they spend $20, they like something. Next time they come in, they're going to spend $40 because they really like it. The third time that they come in, they may spend $100 because they really love your brand. And by that time, they're a a lifetime value customer to you. They're your people. people. So it's always better. I, I, I feel like a lot of these marketers that are out there, and that's not to put them down because they're efficient at, at uh, what they do or what they offer, which is in a lot of cases using your money to get new people in the door, right? And then it's up to you to keep those people. The way that we look at it is we like to get you the right people, and then it's up to you to keep them. And the reason, the way that you keep them is by providing a quality product that people want to come back for, right? That's not our responsibility. If your product is not of quality and and people hate it once they try it and they don't want to come back, then that's a different problem than marketing that should not be blamed on marketing, right? So when when, uh, marketing agencies are coming to you, the first thing that I would do is listen to what the pitch is about, right? And then put it in that, in one of two buckets. Is it that they're coming in and they're saying, let's work with you to understand who your audience is and then try and market to them and measure how effective we are at marketing to them and how we drive up your customer lifetime value while lowering your cost per acquisition, meaning the cost for acquiring a new person over time should go down. We've done, we've done cost per acquisition campaigns uh, for, for clients we had a yoga pant client uh, a while ago that was spending, I think, $100 to acquire a customer. And over time, we went, when, when we started, we were spending like 80 then 60 then uh, down to 20 then down to like $4. People were buying over and, and over and over. And over. People were buying because we were crafting and modifying the message and, and analyzing and continually refining. So that, that really should be the, the strategy, the way that I look at it is lowering your cost per acquisition while increasing your customer lifetime value, the, the length of time that people stay engaged with your company. Now, there's another um, approach, which is there's marketing agencies that come to you with, if you give me $5,000, I will get you 20 new people. But again, in, in X amount of days, yes. in X amount of days, right? So again, that is to me a continual churn machine, right? So you're continually going to pay your $5,000 to get your 20 new people. Who are these 20 new people? Nobody cares. Are you going to keep these 20 new people? Nobody know. cares. <laughs> What's your cost per acquisition? It's always going to be $100. You know, is that an effective way? So that's kind of what you got to think of. Are these guys talking to me about just getting me new people? Or are they talking to me about getting me new customers? You know, Carlos, I got to say. not a one-time person. You're absolutely right. But what came up to in my mind as you were saying that, I was thinking of the business owner. And if I'm getting those two pro- very distinct proposals, right? Mm-hmm. One, I'm getting like a strategy and plan and your customers. And then one is, I'm going to start advertising and we're going to start getting new people. I, as the business owner, am going to go with, I'm going to start, I want want the person that's going to go get me those customers because do I have enough money to pay for time and strategy? That takes time. That is always our biggest dilemma because people go, I don't need the strategy. I just want the guy to go get it. So, but it matters. And the guy that's just going to go get it is the the, the, the people that, the people that go with the the route that you're talking about are the people that then come to us. That's right. 
and they say it doesn't work. Plus years later, and they say digital doesn't work. Well, and the you have to look at it is you know if you're going with the strategist, it's going to has a plan for you. You have to look at it as that is investing in your business. Mm-hmm. That is another investment in your business because you will waste more money to Carl's point trying with the five thousand dollar guy to find the people that are your people than starting with the strategy and going after your people. So yeah. it's patience also on the part of the business owner. Yeah, there's a there's a, a parable in the Bible, which funny enough, I'm going to bring up the Bible, but it because it comes up a lot in um, any sort of, of uh, uh, leadership type uh, training that I've done or listened to that uh, th- there was this guy that was planting the uh, his crop, right? And I don't know the exact parable, so don't judge me guys for this, but it, <laughs> this is the I essence of it, right? Um, so he would, he really wanted to rush that crop. He wanted that crop to grow faster. So he would go out there and water the crop every day and chop it and water it and chop it and what it's like trying to force it to grow faster. And what he ended up doing was destroying his, his entire crop and not getting any yield out of it. Right. Right. So like the it's that same sense. It's are you the desperate business owner that just wants people now, no matter what it's going to cost you in the long term? Or do you take a step back for a second and build a sustainable business that has sustainable growth. Right. And it's the same way that you would approach your business as you've grown it over the years is the same thing to scale your business, just like you would do with hiring more people. It's the same thing. Marketing is the same idea, scaling it, growing it, make sure that you're, you're, you want to be doing it over time. So it gives you the, the, the business that you want over time. And it is. And I'll tell you, I had a client when I first started uh, doing this years ago, And she wanted new customers, right? That's all she wanted. She wanted new customers coming in uh, to her service-based business. And this was before you and I were together. And so she wanted those those customers to come in and she wanted those customers to come in. So we started doing digital advertising and she started seeing two customers coming in, two new customers coming in every day, every other day. And then she was like, okay, well, now I don't, I want to see what happens if I cut my advertising, Uh will I still be getting those customers per day? Because I don't want to spend that kind of money. Okay, we would cut the advertising. So then I went down to one customer every other day. And so then she was like, okay, let's do this. Let's up my advertising on weekends, uh, because that's when I get the most interest from people and and then lower it during the weekdays. Oh my God, it's like gambling. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it, it's like gambling, right? So then she started seeing even less clients. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. It makes yeah. sense because in digital in particular, the algorithms learn by learning over time. They learn over time. So it's not your marketer necessarily uh, once the campaign is going that's doing all these pivots and things. The, the machine learning, which is what powers the digital advertising landscape, learns over time because it learns. Machines don't have brains per se, right? They have uh, their brains are based on data that they gather and they're continually gathering data. And those data sets are getting bigger and bigger over time, which gives them more samples to learn from, right? So this is a big part of what I'm learning in in, in data science, uh, or I continue to learn in data science, that in order for machine learning to be effective, it needs broader and broader and broader sets of training data. Training sets is what they're called, right? So if you're continually changing things, then the machine has to completely start relearning every time, right? Right. So it's hurting your long-term, that anxiety of, okay, I want to spend less. So then I remember one day she came in and she said, you know what? Let's do this. Just grab a big chunk of money and put it in one weekend. Let's see what it does. (laughs) Oh God. So we grabbed a big chunk of money and we put it into the weekend. I, I didn't hear from her on Monday and I didn't hear from her on Tuesday. I'm like, that's weird. So then on Wednesday, I hear from her and she's like, can you just stop all these ads? Our phone numbers, our, our phone has not stopped ringing. I can't deal with all these customers. This is not the way I want to work. This is not effective for me. Everyone in my office is overwhelmed and it's your fault. I'm like, how, how is this my fault? <laughs> you know, How is this my fault? You were not prepared 
to when handle growth. that growth. growth. Yep. Right. So when when someone comes in and is promising you, I can get you ten new clients, they may get you twenty new clients. Do you have the staff to manage that? Scale to that. Yeah. To manage. Can you scale quickly to that, and then downscale? If you're a business owner like us, or any type of business, you know that a lot of these processes take staff, right? And they take people that are trained. And training takes time. Or manufacturing. Like, you know, that yeah. like that whole generation yeah. of manufacturing and products. So right. It's an addiction, right? It's an addiction in that you may go like, okay, this is great. Let me scale up. But what's going to happen with those tactics that are more about persistent driving of people to you is that you're not learning from these people. So you may be getting some people that have a customer lifetime value, you may be getting people that don't. So you may be getting 20 new people of which five become customers that are repeat customers or three or two, right? But you're not learning from them. So your scale is never going to be stable. You're right. all of a sudden, you because you may be converting five people over time, you may be adding staff, but then you start converting three and two. And it's one, and then overhead. back to two, and back to three. And then you don't need that staff person. And then you don't need those two staff people. And then you don't need those three staff people. But then the next day, you do need the three staff people. It's, it's not, insanity. It is It is insanity. And I think to your point, Carlos, and that I, you know, and I love it when we talk about this, because I think it's so important. It's the back end side that people don't see necessarily. Let's talk about when, because people I know, I've seen some proposals recently where it's like, they'd say all the right things about how are we going to measure this for you, right? The metrics. Because you want to know, how do I know if it's working besides just customer coming in my door? Yeah. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see people falling for, or maybe not falling for, a lot of people, you know, I originally, when I first came out of corporate, I thought I'll just build websites, right? Build websites for people. I can make a lot of money making websites for people. And then I started realizing how many people were claiming that they knew how to build websites. I will tell you this. It's like the three little pigs, right? There's the little pig that's going to build you the house of straw. And there's the little pig that's going to build you the house of brick. And the house of straw is going to cost you a heck of a lot less than the house of brick. But if you don't know the difference between the houses, to you, they're all a house, right? And you're going to go with the cheaper one. Right. Why wouldn't you? And that is the same in building a website where people pay the least that they can for a website. And then they say, well, websites don't work. It's pretty though. They didn't invest in SEO. They didn't invest in site speeding. They didn't invest in all the pieces that make your site work for you. Because just putting a site out there is like, I'm going to, I'm going to create a new pencil sharpener. And then I'm just going to put up a website about it and not tell anybody and expect it to sell, right? That's not the way things work. It's the same in digital, right? It's the same in advertising. It's the same in all of it. You have to uh, take the time to do things right right in order for things to be effective for you. And make, so when you're saying about like what somebody, um, if somebody wants to just their agency, what should the agency be looking at that makes me feel comfortable that I know that it's working. Yeah. So when, when you get an agency that's measuring traffic to your website, right? Meaning clicks to your website, that is not an effective measuring of, uh, uh, of, of most strategies for people, right? Because you're looking for something specific. You're looking either for people to set up an appointment with you, or you're looking for people to buy a product off of you, or you're looking for people to, um, like, there's always a reason why you want people to come to you. And in digital in particular, in the digital world, because this is where I most often see this, uh, it, it is measurable. So even if it's awareness, it's measurable. How is awareness measurable? One example of it is, yes, you may get people to your site, but what is the bounce rate? How fast do they get off your site? Did they even, were they even there long enough to see the content or the message or whatever it is that you're trying to get them aware of? 
if people are leaving your site in 0.1 seconds, your site and your site takes nine seconds to load, they never saw your site. They never saw that message. So while you may have gotten clicks to your site, those people are not seeing what you want them to see, right? So that's why it's important to not just take things for granted and say, and know your own metrics at the beginning. So if I'm driving awareness to a website, find out, and this you can find out for free. There's a a Google page speed. Uh, You can Google it, Google page speed on Google. Um, And you put in your URL and it will tell you the average time that your homepage takes to load. So you can know that before you even talk to the marketing agency, right? You can ask them. Well, and you can ask them. So my page speed is at X. How is that going to affect your advertising to that page? Yeah. And when they're giving you reports, if they're telling you, we've got you 10,000 clicks. Okay. But what's my bounce rate and what's my average time on page, right? If my average time on page is three seconds and my homepage takes nine seconds to load, which is a very long time, by the way, but on mobile, it could happen. And a lot of people are on mobile, right? Then people are never seeing your message. Nope. How far down did they scroll on the page? Did they get to see the full message? Did they only get to see a partial of the message? Did they click on a button that I have there in order for me to do, um, to, for them to set up an appointment with me or buy a product of mine? Did they buy the product? Like all of these things are measurable, guys. Right. And your marketing agency should have a setup fee to set up the tracking, set up the analysis, set up everything, set up your accounts. All of that should be set up at the beginning so that you're learning from the moment that you start, not just gaining customers that you never know where they came from. Or here's the thing that I, I, I think to the point that you were making earlier, Dana, of, of clients that are companies that just want new customers. What, what may happen is they may get you 10 customers for $1,000, right? Right. That's not realistic. Let's say 10 customers for, for, for um, yeah, $1,000, that's $100 per customer, right? If you're not learning from them, you're always going to pay $100 per customer. Isn't it better to learn from them, learn what they like? Yes, spend a little more money and time up front, but then lowering those $100 to $80 to $60 to $40 to $2, $5, whatever, somewhere down there where over time, the money that you're spending is getting you a lot more customers. Exactly. Well, and I think you're, you have a great point. One of the things that you should see in your marketing proposal from any agency is that setup. What are the pieces? Are you seeing the types of things that Carlos is talking about as far as the setup is concerned so that you know that they're just not launching? So setup strategy, right? Mm-hmm. And then what is their implementation campaign along the way? And, and that the- is a big part because a lot of questions that we get is what is a real cost for an agency? And there's really two main structures for cost for an agency. One of them is a percentage of the media buy, which is if you're spending $20,000, they'll keep 20% of that. So $4,000, right? A month. Uh, that That would be a percentage of the media buy. And it's usually between 15 and 20%, I would say, of the, the media buy. Yeah. However, if you're spending $100,000, right, then 20% is $20,000. That may be a lot, right, for what you're spending. So at a certain tier, that also becomes a, it could be an agency fee, an agency retainer fee, where you're paying the agency a certain amount a month for them to do the placement of your media right? And the creation of your media. And it could be packages like that. So those are the two ways, the two main ways. Well, yeah. And that's if you're media buying for somebody, or if you're just having somebody that's just handling your marketing, your social, your organic, they're going to charge you a monthly fee. And it's really hard, you guys, to say every every agency, we're at a certain price point. Every agency is a different price point. So I can't tell you $5,000 a month is the fee you should pay or $20,000 is a month the fee you should pay. It really just depends on the agency, your level of business, what you can can afford so that fee is really what you what's more important is what they're going to do for you and how that's the thing the fee is usually tied to whether your campaign is an omni channel campaign or a single channel campaign like the more work that goes into it 
the higher the fee. So you can't expect to have a programmatic omni-channel campaign if you're spending $2,000 a month in, in rent. It's you not can even get somebody to do your social media for that. Yeah, that's, awesome. but, yeah. Right. But, that's a single channel. So. Right, difference what you're looking what you're looking for. Well, we hope this has been super helpful to you. Um, it's always fun to talk about, you know, I, I, we know it's so stressful when you're hiring. It's just like things are stressful for us when we hire out different things that we need, CFOs and, you know, recruiters and all that stuff. It's stressful when it's not your business. So um, we understand and um, hopefully this has been helpful to you and uh, you can pass it on to your friends and uh, check us out next time. Come back and listen some more. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening today. Don't forget to subscribe to and share Wicked Marketing on Apple Podcasts and write an awesome review for us. We are also on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Google Play. See you next time.